such an honor and privilege for us to come together in the house of the Lord and to worship him. And so let's bow together in prayer. Father, we are not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and also to the Greek. And Father, you are the one who enables us to choose the Jesus way, a way that is so radically different that others in the world will look at that way and they'll think, <laughs> no way, that's not for me. But Lord, the Spirit of God has worked in our hearts. He's broken through the stubbornness of our pride and even given us hope in the midst of our, our shortcomings and our failures and even our greatest sins. And so we thank you for the Jesus way. We thank you for the good news of Jesus that causes great joy to all people. And Father, as we bring to conclusion a Thanksgiving weekend, we know it's also the beginning of a posture of gratitude and praise for the ultimate gift that you give to us through your one and only Son. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be the one who is honored, that your Son would be exalted, and your Spirit would be the one upon whom we lean upon each and every day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we have David and Sarah and David and Vivian and Derek. And they're handling our live stream, our, our sound in the house, the slides, the live stream audio for those of you at home joining us in worship. And for the last, man, it's been almost four years. It's hard to believe that this coming spring will be four years since we've been live streaming our services. And one of the benefits and the blessings of the live stream is to be able to watch our services again. And, and for those of you that maybe are traveling on the road or for those of you that are at home and not feeling well or those who are out of the area, the live stream option is a good option to bring us together in worship. But naturally, there is no substitute for being here in person at Bread of Life Church. But one of the things that I'll do in the beginning of the week is to to watch the service again and to, to listen and to, to see what that experience was like for our worshipers as well as for myself. And this last week, I had the joy and privilege of listening to each and every one of our baptismal candidates, the 11, that publicly identify themselves with Jesus in water baptism. So I could hear again Andrew and Benjamin and Calvin and Cameron and Claire and Eliana and Olivia and Ryan and Sophia and Warren and when she. And I could hear them stand in the baptistry giving audible testimony to sometimes that inexpressible work that God does in each of our lives as we trust in Jesus as our personal Savior. And last week, we also welcomed three new members into our church. We welcomed Angie and Tyler and Claire. And I asked them, what, what are some of the things that prompted them to publicly identify themselves and to join the membership of the Bread of Life Church. Having been baptized and having been an attender of our church for a certain length of time, what is it that prompted them to join? And this is what Angie said. Angie said, I volunteered for the past few years with our Bread of Life Christian Children's Center in Awana. My two daughters went to the BOL CCC preschool and now they're part of the after school care and they've also been a part of our Awana ministry. We've been attending the English worship and Sunday school, and I appreciate how our church is committed to faithfully preaching the gospel with humility and obedience. And she says our church family has been very friendly and welcoming, and we're so glad to be here. Tyler shared this. She said, in my new chapter in life, I wanted to find a church where I can grow in Christ be in community and serve with other believers. It's been a great experience to be a part of the youth ministry here, and I'm excited to see what else God has in store for me at Bread of Life Church. And then one thing I appreciate about Clara is Clara shared that she loves the opportunity to connect with different members within our church. And one of the things that stands out to her 
is that she feels this is a community that is real, that there's an authenticity, there's a, a genuineness that is hard to find in communities of faith. And for each of our new members, there's a strong and there's an underlying realization that we have experienced the best news ever. In Jesus, we naturally and, and we, we strategically and we intentionally look for opportunities to invite others along with us for the journey. And then sometimes in our conversations, and maybe you had a conversation this last weekend over the Thanksgiving holiday, maybe even around the dinner table or for dessert. And in a conversation, you hit a roadblock of sorts where you are just poised and you're prayed up and you're prayed over and you're so excited to share about your faith in Jesus. And it seems to hit a brick wall. And all of a sudden, the climate of the room changes. And they give you this look that says, are you crazy? Do you think I'm really interested in what you are buying into? And we sadly and we strangely and we, with an overwhelming sense of perplexity, are overwhelmed with a sense of sadness that not everyone is willing to follow the Jesus way. Even as we wisely present Jesus as our Messiah, some foolishly reject him as their Lord. I mean, you could be prayed up. You could be read, read up. You could be so saturated with wisdom and, and so filled with the Spirit of God. And you could have this dexterity of conversational skills where wherever the conversation takes you, you could respond to the challenge that comes before you. And yet, even as we wisely and faithfully and strategically and powerfully present Jesus as our Messiah, some will look, some will look at you and think, what? Not on your life. And some will foolishly reject Jesus as their Lord. Despite our most rational explanation of Jesus, of who he is and what he's done for us, others may label us as crazy. And the title for today's message is Sanity Defense. Because the Apostle Paul is appearing before a Jewish leader named King Agrippa. And it's not a formal hearing. And Paul boldly defends his ministry to the Gentiles and his message about Jesus as our Savior. And like his initial defense before the crowd in chapter 22 of the book of Acts, the apostle explains how everything changes all at once, everywhere in his life. As he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. And yet he's going to add some fresh details that are not recorded in the earlier accounts in the book of Acts, chapter 9 and chapter 22. And recounting the story of his own religious background and how Jesus appears and radically reframes his whole outlook and his, the good news that he announces to both Jews and Gentiles about a once dead, now risen Messiah, that that's going to be too much for a Roman judge. In fact, the judge is going to interrupt the Apostle Paul rudely and he's going to lash out at Paul and he's going to say, you're crazy. You've had a psychological break with the reality. You're psychotic. You've gone bonkers. You've studied too much, the Apostle Paul. And when this Roman judge who has the responsibility to exercise wisdom on the highest level, when he hears the Apostle Paul recounting the transformative experience that he encountered once he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and how that radically retold every part of his heart and his soul and his mind, and how his life was moving in one direction, full steam ahead, and how Jesus radically, dramatically, and decisively completely turned it around in a totally different direction. 
This guy's going to look at Paul and says, you are insane. It makes absolutely no sense at all. And Paul is going to exercise the greatest display of cordiality and grace and restraint and even respect in his response to this ludicrous charge that he is the one who's crazy. And Paul is going to say, you know what, people might plea insanity as a defense where they're going to say, you know what, I just, yeah, I, I did what you are charging me of doing and, and I just did it in a crazy moment so I'm not culpable for my actions. Paul is saying, no, that's not me, I'm not the crazy one. But the defense that he gives is absolutely sane. It's completely reasonable. It aligns with reality. It is totally rational. It is a sanity defense. And Paul is going to say it's the person who actually says no to Jesus and bypasses the offer of forgiveness and eternal life in Jesus that is the one who needs to take a second look at reality. Because they're the one who's making the foolish decision. They're the one who is out of their mind. Here's a question to consider today. Why do some believe that our faith in Jesus is crazy? I mean, it might be a classmate of yours. It could be a neighbor. It could be a colleague. It could be a relative. You know, it could be one of your lifelong best friends, maybe even your bestest friend who's not yet a follower of Christ, and, and you love everything about them except their refusal to accept Jesus as their Savior. And, and you've been praying and, and sharing and planting the seeds of the gospel and, and watering and doing everything that you could. But then they look at you and they think, well, good for you, but not good for me. I'm not that crazy. And why is it that some people believe that our faith in Jesus is something that we would only decide to do if we are out of our mind? And so we are so grateful to Antifaith and for all those that are caring for our youngest worshipers and our hope for our youngest students from the nursery. Helen's in the nursery this morning, uh, watching the kids, being with them. All the way through fifth grade, all of our teachers through our elementary age students, our hope is that they would love the Lord their God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their strength, and with all of their mind. And that they would come to this this unshakable conviction that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So when we talk with Jesus, when we talk about Jesus with others, whatever their age, some are going to like and some are going to dislike. Some will favor it and some will not (laughs) check back into that conversation with us. And that's what we're going to see as we meet up together in the final part of Acts chapter 25, continuing through all of chapter 26. And so as we have been thinking about what it means to be faithful to the end, that is faithful to the end of the earth and faithful to the end of our lives, we, like the Apostle Paul, want to be fighting the good fight and we want to be running the race and we want to be keeping the faith. And even as the Apostle Paul and Peter and John and and faithful men and women of the book of Acts model for us what it means to bring the gospel into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, we're going to see how the Apostle Paul continues to bear witness to the facts of who Jesus is, even as he stands before those who have the highest level of respect and governing authority within his generation. And so we're going to see at the end of chapter 25, through most of chapter 26, a reasonable presentation of what Jesus has accomplished for us. Paul is going to stand before King Agrippa, and it's not a literal formal hearing, but it's more of a, of a consultation that another Roman governor, Festus, has tapped into Agrippa in his knowledge of all things Jewish and Judaism related. He's tapping into Agrippa like a consultant to bring some wisdom and help into the situation. And Paul is going to provide this incredibly reasonable presentation of what Jesus has accomplished for us through his work. 
And then we're going to see in the last nine verses of our study today, in a, in a rational dismissal of what we have testified about Jesus. And this is where Festus, although he is on the sideline, as it were, an auditor to this hearing, he blurts out in disbelief over what he has heard Paul give witness to. And so standing before an impressive array of these high-powered military and local leaders, this faithful servant of God shows us how to give a reasonable presentation of what Jesus has accomplished for us. So let's take a look beginning at verse 23 to the end of chapter 25. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes or tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in, and Festus said, King Agrippa, and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found, factually, evidentially, through my own examination, that he had done nothing deserving death. And as he himself appeared to the emperor, appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write to the Lord, to my Lord Caesar, about him. Therefore, I brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seemed unreasonable to me in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. In the middle part of chapter 25, toward the end of our passage last week, Paul was sensing that Festus was collapsing under the pressure being applied to him by the Jewish religious leaders. And so Paul realizes that the climate of the room is shifting. It's, it's escalating and it's moving toward the favor of the Jewish leadership. So Paul exercises his ultimate right as a Roman citizen. And he says, well, I want to do this, um, you know, provocatio. I want to have my case appeal to Caesar. That is, before Festus weighs in and makes a decision, I want Caesar to take my case in Rome. And Paul has no issue with that because he realizes that Festus is losing his objectivity. But he also understands that Jesus has appeared to Paul and given this strong sense of reassurance that just as Paul has given testimony to the facts about Jesus in Jerusalem, that Paul is going to also be sent by Jesus to Rome to bear witness to the reality of his death and resurrection. So Paul has no problems moving out of Caesarea into Roman territory to have his case tried. With Paul's request that now being taken out of Festus's hands, Festus has to do due diligence, so he just can't send a, a prisoner to Caesar without a letter of explanation. But he has nothing to write. From his legal perspective, he should declare that Paul is innocent and let him free. But because he's relinquishing to the pressure of the Jewish religious authorities, he's not willing to let him go. And, and Felix has already left Paul in prison for two long years, and Festus has extended this delay of justice for the Apostle Paul and his vindication and release. And so Festus is saying, Man, Agrippa, you know things you know, related to the Jewish customs and their practices, and can you help me out? Can you maybe maybe create or fabricate or help me to know what to write. It's kind of like someone going to another student who does really well in a class and you don't have, you can't make left or right from this view of, of what you're learning and listening to and, and you want to get a tutor to help you to understand the subject. And in the same way, the, the, the case of the Apostle Paul is black and white to Festus, but Festus is trying to make it a little bit more gray so that he could send Paul to Caesar in Rome with somewhat of a quasi-legitimate explanation for this change of venue. In the middle of chapter 25, Luke introduces us to King Agrippa II. And he's the son of Herod Agrippa I, 
who died in judgment in Acts chapter 12. That was the passage that uh, Will spared, uh, shared from earlier this year. And King Herod Agrippa II is also the great-grandson of Herod the Great, who ruled during the time of Jesus' birth, who we hear about during this time of year. And alongside of Agrippa is Bernice, who's his sister. And Bernice was twice married, and, and both of her previous husbands died after a brief marriage. And it already raises a little bit of suspicion about Bernice. And then after the death of her second husband, which was to her uncle, an incestuous relationship, she lived with her brother Agrippa for 15 years, and there was also the rumor of an incestuous relationship. This is absolutely gross between Agrippa and Bernice. And to try to dispel the rumors of this incestuous relationship, she married someone else, someone named um, Polymon. In fact, as I was typing Polymon, it wanted to correct it to Pokemon. <laughs> but she wasn't married to Pokemon. This is pre-Pokemon. But that marriage didn't last, and she went back to Agrippa. And then she had a, a, a relationship as a mistress to someone else. So, so here you have Agrippa and Bernice, this really morally messed up relationship. And yet, ironically, Festus is saying, hey, Agrippa, Bernice, could you come and be my advisors, my consultant into the case that I have with the Apostle Paul? And with such moral ugliness in their own lives, they're called to exercise judgment and wisdom. Turning over to chapter 26, Paul begins his defense, essentially explaining how Jesus supernaturally and dramatically transformed the one-time persecutor of the church into this one-of-a-kind proclaimer of the gospel. Chapter 26, verse 1. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. And then Paul stretched out his hand, and, and that's the gesture of an orator. And he made his defense. And he began with this word to capture the goodwill of the judge. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa. I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and the controversies of the Jews. And therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently and then he explains the defense. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own, my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. I mean, this is public knowledge. People know my reputation and my resume of experience. They know my track record. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by Jews, O king. But then he raises a, this rhetorical question. that strikes at the heart of what he's defending and representing. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Grateful for the privilege of addressing a ruler, not like Claudius, Lysias, and Felix, who are Roman leaders, but someone like King Agrippa, who has an insider appreciation of Judaism. In fact, Paul says, the customs that unite us, as well as the controversies that tear us apart, like the Sadducees and the Pharisees, both Jewish but worlds apart. 
and their theological positions. The missionary evangelist, church planter apologist, pleads for Agrippa's full and complete attention to his words. He says, man, what I'm going to sh- share with you might seem a little bit out of the ordinary, and it is out of the ordinary. What I'm about to say to you will, will just absolutely blow apart your preconceived categories, but Paul is essentially saying, Agrippa, lend me your ear. Before you make any rash judgment, sit tight and listen with the greatest level of objectivity and openness to the words that I will share with you. And first and foremost, Paul says, you know, I'm not a freak. I'm not a virus like, like my, my fellow Jews are accusing me of. They call me this virus that is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes and someone who's a rogue leader that is, that is troubling not only the Jewish community, but is subversive and insurrectionist threat to the peace of Rome. Paul says, I'm not this threat. I, I, I'm not guilty of the accusations that are being thrown at me. Paul says, first and foremost, just like my accusers claim to be, I am a God-fearing, law-abiding, scripture-affirming Jew who embraces the hope of the resurrection. And if you look at the verses that we just read, man, Paul is underscoring that element of hope the hope of his fathers, the hope of the God of Israel, the hope that they have been worshiping and longing and looking for. And Paul says, man, the simple truth is that I stand on trial today because of the hope of the resurrection of Jesus. And Paul says, you know, (laughs) I can't get it. I mean, if if they say that they believe in the God who created the world and the God who makes his promises that are just absolutely mind-blowing and life-giving, how could it be a shock or a surprise to anyone that God raises the dead? And Paul is scratching the side of his head and just in bewilderment at his accusers and saying, how could they deny the very hope that we share together as the people of God? It was because of his commitment to the truth of God. It was because he was a Pharisee, someone who took God and his law seriously, that he once believed that Christians were deceived in believing and proclaiming Jesus as the risen Messiah. And that's why Paul did everything in his power to stop what he originally perceived to be harmful and heretical. Take a look at verse 9. I myself was convinced that it ought to do many things. It was his life purpose in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death and I was there, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues, and I tried to make them blaspheme, that is, to deny the name of Jesus. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to the foreign cities. You see, prior to meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, Paul's life mission included doing everything that he could to blot out Christians from the face of the earth. And Paul says, man, I spent time, I spent money, I spent my energy. It was the thing I thought about when I woke up. It was the thing I thought about when I went to sleep. It was the thing that brought satisfaction and exhilaration and joy in my heart when I was eliminating those that I thought were blasphemous to the God that I worship. 
And there are some people who, when, when they look at the Christian faith, and, and there are those that say, man, everything about it I am against, and the Bible is false, and Jesus is a charade, and, and he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's fabricated in our imagination, and any hope of eternal life is just wishful thinking, and then God breaks through to them and opens their hearts. And yet they look at their pre-Jesus days, and they say, that's exactly what Paul was like. That everything that they associated with the person of Jesus, that Paul was against. He did many hostile things against the name of Jesus. In fact, even traveling to try to blot out the name of the gospel. Take a look at verse 12. Paul makes a personal transition. He says, in this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. And at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when he had, we had fallen, all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And a goad was like a stick that would be used to, to point animals in a certain direction. And for Jesus to say to Paul, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. It's like, hey, you know what? If this is a work of Jesus, if this is a work of God, then you've got to stop resisting. If God is moving within your heart, you've got to stop running away. If Jesus is present in this reality, then you've got to give in and submit and surrender your heart to him. The Apostle Paul recounts what happened in chapter 9 and what he repeated in chapter 22. As he begins publicly defending his faith before the highest levels of authority. And he tells Agrippa that he saw this light from heaven brighter than the sun. And then he heard a voice in the Hebrew language identified as Jesus, as the one he, he was persecuting. And recognizing that this is a God thing, Paul seeks additional clarity in verse 15. Paul says, hey, you know, at that moment I said, <laughs> This is the road where it happened, where everything, everywhere changed all at once. And Paul says, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. You didn't just vote in approval of Stephen's death. You didn't simply chase down random Christians in different cities. You didn't simply try to go to other places and extradite them back to Jerusalem. Jesus said, this is a personal thing. That when you persecute followers of Jesus, that you are persecuting Jesus himself. And then using language that the Lord uses to speak to prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Jesus speaks to Paul in verse 16. But rise and stand upon your feet. That's exactly what the Lord said to Ezekiel. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you. Delivering you from your people, the same language that he used to commission Jeremiah, that he would have a ministry that would literally cause him to weep, but that God would deliver him out of troubling situations. And in the same way, Jesus said, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The risen and exalted Messiah appoints Jesus as a servant and witness of the gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles, 
to be a messenger of, of hope that turns them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they could receive forgiveness of their sins and a place among those who believe as men and women and students who are set apart to God. In coming to grips with his new identity and calling, Paul is quick to rise and to stand upon his feet just as Jesus commands. Take a look at verse 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. In other words, I was quick to respond, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles, his first and his second and his third missionary expeditions, his road and sea trips for the gospel of God. That they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. And for this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and they tried to kill me. And to this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here, testifying both to small and to great, to those that are little in society's eyes, and to those who are great, like all of those gathered in this audience hall, the military leaders and Agrippa and the civic, civic leaders, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ might suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. You see, the persecutor turned apostle instantly discovers that what goes around comes around. The one-time hunter of Christians now becomes the hunted because he preaches a message of repentance and faith and restoration to God, not only to the Jewish people, but also to the Gentiles. And when the Jews heard that, they thought, wow, you know, it's one thing to be a, a servant of God to the Jews, but now that you are giving testimony and opportunity for Gentiles who in the eyes of the Jews deserve God's judgment and are objects of his wrath and are not worthy of salvation. They think, think this guy is out of his mind. How could Paul have a ministry, not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles, where he's not only proclaiming a crucified Messiah, but a risen king? But Paul is saying, I'm not some rogue prophet who crafts my own message. But he simply and faithfully and consistently testifies to everything that the prophets and Moses declared. In other words, he falls within the boundary of biblical revelation. He's not creating his own message. He's not leading his own movement. He's not ego-tripping and, and doing his own thing. But he is a God-appointed servant of the gospel, sent to bring hope and forgiveness and life to whoever is willing to listen. And when I looked at verse 22, I thought, man, is that where they get the phrase, so help me God? That when someone takes an oath of office and they put their hand on the Bible and, and they say, so help me God? And I wonder if it's from verse 22 where Paul says, you know what? God has given me this privilege and opportunity to be a witness to the gospel and to appear before those that are microcosmic in societal terms and those that are macro huge, mega type leaders the movers and the shakers in our culture, and that whoever God calls me to speak to, that he's the one that helps us to speak for him. And I want us to remember that whoever God brings you before, someone that is, that is in the eyes of the world, someone not that huge, or maybe someone that gets tons of respect and adulation and recognition, that God is the one who gives us the help and the confidence and the clarity of speech to bear witness to the person of Christ and what he's done for us. In preparation for today, I, I couldn't help but think about, you know, family and friends. 
that when they hear the gospel, <laughs> for those of you at home, some Bible app is reading the passage for us. Okay, so we're trying to get over that. But they hear the gospel and they say, well, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Why is it that people do that? I think, you know, one is people will say, well, I'm too busy. We've got a lot going on. But then we neglect to prioritize what's valuable. And they say, well, you know, when, when my life gets a little more simply, you know, defined, and, and maybe when I'm, I'm out of school or into this next job or into retirement, or when I, when, when I get through this transition, then when I have more time, then I'll think about it. But the fact is, we always prioritize what we cherish, what we consider weighty. The second was someone who says, well, I'm too smart. We limit our knowledge of truth to what we ourselves can ascertain and discover. But then we ignore the reality of objective truth, the possibility of revelation outside of ourselves. The third reason why people might say thanks but no thanks is they'll say, well, I'm too successful. I've got a lot going on. I mean, I'm happy. I don't need Jesus. I mean, isn't Jesus for the anxiety-ridden and the depressed and those that have no purpose in life? I mean, I've got purpose. I've got wealth. I've got family. I've got friends. I mean, I am the epitome of success with a capital S. And their limited definition of success with material prosperity it blinds us from really grasping how spiritually bankrupt we are before God. And then I thought there are those that say, well, I'm just too lost. I mean, my life is just really, it's, it's too messed up. There's no way that I could ever make it to heaven. But that miscalculates the entry point of God's kingdom. And we generally think, oh, if I'm good, then I get to go. But no, it's when we recognize that we're not good enough and we could never be good enough. But it's what Jesus has accomplished for us that is the basis for eternal life. And that we go upon his merits and his work and not what we accomplish. In the closing segment of our chapter, two thoughtful, influential rulers Festus and Agrippa brush aside the chance to put their faith in Jesus. In fact, things get a little bit testy when Paul verbalizes his hope that his testimony will persuade them also to believe. And so even after a reasonable presentation of what Jesus has accomplished for us through his death and resurrection, it's not unusual to hear an irrational dismissal of what we have testified about Jesus. Take a look at verse 24. Although he's playing more of a secondary role with Agrippa, running this particular hearing, Festus just cannot stop himself from reacting to what he's heard. So he cuts Paul off mid-sentence. And as Paul was saying these things, I mean, he is in the middle of his defense. Festus said with a loud voice, and the word there is megalophone. It's like megaphone. Festus is just so beside himself that he goes, <laughs> He becomes unglued. He looks like the madman. He gets crazy. He says, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul, with all due respect, said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking true and rational words. And shouting at the top of his lungs, Festus, like I could imagine him just standing up and slamming his fist in the table and saying, Paul! You've lost it. You've checked out of reality. You are psychotic. You've had this crazy break with reality. 
Just listen to yourself. You are so educated beyond your intelligence. You are so stuck in your books that you have lost touch with reality. And then I thought, what did Paul say? Paul basically said, what radically turned my life around from a dangerous persecutor of the church into a global ambassador for God's kingdom is that the crucified Messiah has risen from the dead, appeared to me on the road to Damascus, and called me to lead both Jews and Gentiles to repentance to God and faith in him and to be forgiven of their sins and have a place in heaven. And for the already convinced, we think, that's it. But for the skeptic and for the outsider and for even someone like a Festus and Agrippa, they listen to those words and they think, what? Come again? You got this vision from heaven? You got this voice in Hebrew from this resurrected Messiah? You've received a new commission, no longer destroying the church, but building it up? That you pronounce the forgiveness of sins on the basis of faith and repentance? I mean, <laughs> for the outsider, that sounds really crazy. Eugene Peterson's The Message paraphrases it this way. Paul, you're crazy. You've read too many books, spent too much time <laughs> staring off into space. Get a grip on yourself. Get back in the real world. What the, what the apostle declares comes across as foreign. It's strange. It's out of this world. But it is. It's the gospel truth. And apart from the Holy Spirit convicting our hearts, illuminating our minds, empowering our wills, we would also dismiss the gospel of Jesus as far-fetched and unreasonable. But, you know, when I hear this exchange between Festus and Paul, we learn that the litmus test for truth is not what seems rational to our minds or feels right within our hearts, but it's what God has revealed in his word. That's the bottom line. Redirecting the conversation back to Agrippa, who's familiar with the public nature of the Christian movement as well as the anticipation of hope in the scriptures. The innocent defendant now becomes the courageous evangelist. Verse 26, for the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. I, I, got, I can speak with you freely like someone who is familiar with these truths. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Isaiah, Isaiah Ezekiel. I know that you believe these things. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? We don't know the tone behind the question, whether he's being sarcastic or sincere. And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am except for these chains. See, whether it's a quick decision or a slow process, whether it happens right there and right then, or whether it's after multiple conversations. Paul says, my hope is that you, Agrippa, and even you, Fistus, and, and everyone else who's hearing these words, that you will actually believe in Jesus and become a Christian. And I thought, what is it that enables Paul to have this winning combination where there is a defense of our faith that produces a decision for Jesus? And I think like the Apostle Paul, first of all, it means that we are willing to be persistent. Don't be discouraged. I mean, if someone like Festus you know, barks back at you and says, are you crazy? Don't give up. 
Because for every Festus, there's an Agrippa. Someone else that we can engage with who maybe is more inclined to a conversation. The second is be persuasive. Don't be complacent. Be willing to speak to what they know. And, and Paul looks at Agrippa and says, I know that you know the prophets. I know that you believe in them. I know that you know that the Christian faith is not something that's just happened behind closed doors. And he tries to appeal to his mind and to reason with him. A third is to be persevering. Don't be impatient because Paul says, hey, you know what, Agrippa, whether short or long, man, I'm here for the long haul. I just want you to come to faith. So be persevering. And the fourth is to be perceptive. Don't be short-sighted. See, whenever we defend our faith before others, it's not just about winning an argument about truth. It's about leading an individual to faith in Jesus. We want to win the argument for truth, but that is not it. That's not the cul-de-sac of our conversations. We want to lead that person to faith in Jesus because apologetics is a bridge to evangelism. Take a look at verse 30. Then the king rose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them and when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this is behind closed doors, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. There is a mutual confirmation of Paul's innocence. Tim Keller, who for many years pastored in New York City, went to be with the Lord this past summer after a battle with pancreatic cancer, said that the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Christ Jesus than we ever dared hope. And you just want to linger over the truth of those words. That on the one hand, man, we are sinful and flawed and condemned and separated in a way that we could never imagine. And yet, in Christ, we are more loved and accepted and motivated and recreated than we could ever hope for eternity. This profound and astonishing reality, it moves us to worship God with our whole heart, especially during this weekend. And yet the crazy thing is that some will hear the same truth and say, you know what, it's not for me. And even as we wisely present Jesus as our Messiah, the fact is that some foolishly reject him as their Lord. And so when that happens, let's be like Paul, who never missed a beat in panic, but always seized an opportunity with hope. And however long it takes, let's remain steady in our wish that others who hear our words and also see our actions, that they will join us in following Jesus as our Messiah and as our Lord. Let's pray together. The good news of the gospel of Jesus is that in and of ourselves, we are more sinful and flawed than we could ever believe. And yet God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross. And then Jesus also rose from death to life to give us hope that we could be loved and accepted and received in a way that literally blows us away. And that is the most reasonable, the most rational and sane decision we could ever make is to say yes to Jesus 
and to receive eternal life through him. And I want to invite you to do that today. Where you say, you know what, the Jesus way, I used to think was crazy. But God is helping me to see that it makes sense. And so I choose to follow him. And I trust in him as my Savior and as my Messiah. Father, we honor you today because you give us opportunities not only to live, but to bless and to share the life of Jesus with others. And so we pray that we would be found faithful in doing that this coming week. And we pray this in his name. Amen.